Hi, everyone. From uh, coast to coast to coast on whatever traditional unceded territory you may be on in so-called Canada, and anyone from around the world, everyone, uh, wherever we may be, tends to be standing on Indigenous territory. So I just want to thank you, each and every one of you, for taking time today to join us uh, on this a uh, really exciting webinar. I'm very excited about it. Why some trees keep their leaves, considerations for indigenous community safety and well-being. With our keynote today, KUA Tin, Dr. Heidi Stark. A quick note to say that I'll be moderating this, um, I think, impactful and informative webinar today. My name's Sarah DeLeo. Um, I divide my time between Tlaitle territory and Sulks territory of the Insulchin peoples, uh, Insulchin speaking people down here in the southern geographies of so-called British Columbia. I am um, excited about joining this webinar virtually. I grew up and have spent my entire life really on the unceded territories of British Columbia, growing up with a Dutch father and an Irish Canadian mother, growing up uh, on Haida Gwaii and finishing high school in Simpsian territories, where I've been working as a feminist anti-colonial scholar and activist in efforts to confront white supremacy, which I know is going to be a, a part of today's conversation. Next slide, Sarah, if you don't mind. And a quick thanks uh, to the folks behind the scenes, including Sarah, who is advancing slides. Sarah, if you want to flip over to the next slide. And Lisa, um, who have done so much work behind the scenes with the NCCIH to bring us these webinar series. Thanks again, Sarah and Lisa. For those of you who are not familiar with the NCCIH, we're one of six national collaborating centers uh, for public health that was established in 2005. We're funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada, and our sister NCCs are focused on specific topic areas, including infectious disease, environmental health, public health policies, determinants of health, and methods and tools for knowledge translation. Our NCCIH for Indigenous Health is the only NCC focused on the health of a population. We support health equity for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We promote the use of Indigenous informed evidence to transform practice, policy, and program decision-making uh, works across all sectors of public health, hence the kinds of work that we are focused on today. The NCCIH, the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health, is located at the University of Northern British Columbia's Prince George campus, which is situated on the unceded traditional stolen territory of the Tlaitlaitene First Nations, who are part of the Dekalf Carrier People's Territory. Next slide, Sarah, if you don't mind. Just a quick few webinar housekeeping notes. Uh, and thanks again for all of you who have joined and are return joiners to this webinar series. It's a, it's a beautiful thing that each and every one of you are taking time out of your busy days to join this webinar. All questions for panelists, as well as any technical issues can be submitted in the Q&A window. Links to resources mentioned by the speakers are gonna be posted in the chat window. Today's webinar, as you will have noted when you came in and noted on your screen, is being recorded and will then make it available on the NCCIH website. So if there's things that you want to return to, questions that you think uh, were answered or inf information that you want to uh, reflect on, just go to the NCCIH webinar. Give us a few weeks to kind of um, tidy everything up, but it will be available. And there may be a note, uh, there may be brief pauses when we switch between presenters. So don't worry, uh, we haven't glitched out too, too badly. With that in mind, uh, next slide, Sarah. We also want to say that uh, many of the topics that are covered in NCCIH webinars can be difficult topics. Um, let's be clear, colonial violence is a violence and it can be difficult to speak about and to learn about, particularly for people who embody the realities about which are uh, being spoken. So I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, if any of uh, what you're about to learn about uh, and be in dialogue with today uh, is triggering for you, um, please let us know uh, or take note now of the resources on the screen and honestly don't feel shy. Uh, don't feel shy to reach out to supports that um, might uh, 
might might be good. Next slide, please, Sarah. Um, yeah, I it's hard for me to put entirely into words, as uh, sometimes happens for those of us asked to introduce incredibly inspirational thinkers and speakers to say what a genuine honor, honestly, a delight to join you all today in learning from Kewitin, uh, Dr. Heidi Stark. I am a deep admirer of Dr. Stark's work. We have friends and activists and scholars in common who I also know think the world of Dr. Stark's work. Dr. Stark is a Turtle Mountain Anishinaabekwe Associate Professor in the Indigenous Governance Program at the University of Victoria. She's a director of the Center for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement, that circle. Uh, please do look it up online. Amazing resources, amazing people, and amazing work. Dr. Stark holds a PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota, and her research work include Indigenous law and governance, treaty rights, Indigenous politics in the United States and Canada. Next slide, please. With those layers of expertise and wisdom, today's webinar will examine two aspects of community well being housing and community safety. In the first part of her talk, Dr. Stark considers housing as a human right and as a treaty right. In doing so, she examines Indigenous legal orders in relation to housing, as well as discusses ind Indigenous jurisdiction regarding housing, encampments, and policymaking. Dr. Stark calls for expanding Indigenous jurisdiction beyond the duty to consult, arguing instead for ontologies of care and obligations. In this move, in this calling for a move toward ontologies of care, Dr. Stark then turns her focus to Indigenous law and responses to concerns about community safety with a focus on using ban council resolutions to carry out the banishment of members and non-members who are threatening community well-being. Indeed, Dr. Stark's talk today fundamentally asks what it means to take up ontologies of care and obligations in these complicated contexts. Next slide, please, Sarah. We are going to now turn it over to Dr. Stark. Um, I am, again, delighted and honored to uh, be witness to what you're about to offer us today. Heidi, thanks so much for presenting with the NCCIH. Sarah, please feel free to take the slides down and we will pass everything to Dr. Stark. Heidi, welcome and thank you so much. Miigwech, Sarah. Thank you for that uh, generous and kind introduction. Bonjour uh, and dinoe maganaduk, mino gigajeb, or depending what time zone you're in, mino bishikak. Bungi etago ninita nishinabeng, kiwe nipanesik indigo, nipanesi inguime, bijou and dodem. Mikanako juing in Dunjaba Dash, Victoria, BC, and da nongo. So good morning or good afternoon to everyone. I just want to begin by acknowledging uh, the Songhees and Esquimalt people, uh, the Lekwungen speaking people of these territories where I both live and work. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Wasanich people who also hold a relationship to these lands. So my name is Heidi or Kiwetin Benisik or Kiwetin for short. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Anishinaabe Kwe. Um, my family comes from Turtle Mountain, which is in North Dakota. Um, and I grew up uh, largely off reserve. And um, I'm from the Lynx clan. And uh, as Sarah also mentioned, I'm currently an associate professor here at UVic uh, in the Indigenous, uh, the School of Indigenous Governance. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be with you today. And I just want to thank both of the Sarahs and Lisa for all the work um, that they put into making this um, presentation uh, opportunity available to me. Um, and of course, I wanna thank all of you who have tuned in and hope that I can really make this worth your time. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you some of your own thoughts and reflections um, as this is kind of newer work I've been thinking about in relation to uh, Anishinaabe law and our own um, kind of context around ontologies of care and, and responsibility and obligations to one another. 
So with that in mind, I want to begin with a story. Uh, and the version I'll be uh, telling today comes from a collection um, by Mary uh, Cisa Genius, um, which her daughter edited, uh, McCoons, um, and it's called Plants Have So Much to Give Us, All We Have to Do is Ask. So there are many uh, many Anishinaabe stories in this book um, that may be of interest to some of you. The one I want to start with today is called Why Some Trees Keep Their Leaves When Others Do Not. So one time, uh, there was once this little bird, a Benishi, who had a serious problem. This little bird had been blown off a tree branch and broke its wing. He huddled in pain and feared through the night and was most happy to see the sun rising the next morning. He heaved a great sigh of relief and tried to stretch his wings to fly off to find his family, but his wing would not work. The little Benishi sat for some time pondering his problem and then decided to make the best of things until his wing was strong again. He found that he could still hop very well so he could get around enough to find his meals and cool drinks, um, take cool drinks of water in the stream. By day, he sat on a low branch and watched as his friends and family, um, as they took short, then long, then longer flights around the clearing, preparing for their coming trip to the Southland. The little Benishi tried not to worry, and he sang his best songs to cheer his family and himself. But as fall came, the days were shorter and colder. His family and friends stayed as long as they dared, but in the end, they had to call to that little Benishi, wishing him well and promising to see him when it was spring again. They took to the air and soon that little Benishi was alone. For a time he felt very sad and almost too frightened to do anything. He had never been alone before. He tried not to think about it too long. He tried not to think about the long hard winter that was to come. His kind had always left the Northland at this time of year and did not return until the warm breezes came again. After a while, though, the little Benishi said to himself, well, I'm alone now for a time, but I can still sing a cheery song and I can still hop about and I can still take care of myself. My family would not want me to lose heart. So that little Benishi tucked his broken wing close to his body and went about his daily busy little life as best as he could. After a while, he found that it was really not so bad. He found ways of doing the things he had done before when he had the use of both wings. It might take him longer to find his supper and a place to sleep, but if he tried, he found he could do rather well in the cool days during fall. But then winter came. The days grew even shorter and the sun seemed far away. That north wind, Giwaden, wore down upon the lands and the first snow swirled about that little Benishi as he hopped around his daily journeys. That north wind blew and blew and that little Benishi huffed his feathers up so that he would not be so cold. He hopped across the clearing hoping to find help. Oh, beautiful Iguasimitig, beautiful birch tree, said that little Benishi. I have a broken wing and I could not go with my family when they left for the Southland. Could I shelter in your beautiful white limbs and hide myself in your leaves so I will not be cold when the north wind blows? No, said that Wigwasimitig with a disdainful toss of his leaves. We in the forest have our own winter birds whom we must foster this time of year. I, for one, do my part, but I'm not interested in taking care of any other Benishiug who should have blown away by now. Be off with you. Well, wow, thought that little Benishi, that Wigwesimitig does not seem very friendly. Perhaps he just has such weak branches that he's afraid the weight of another Benishi may be too much when Giwaden starts to blow again. I'll just go ask that oak tree, Mittigumoj, for help. He's such a strong wood. Surely he'll be able to help me. So that little Benishi hopped over to that oak tree and asked him for help. 
he asked if he could hide in the leaves close to the trunk of that mighty, mighty oak. But the oak said, winter is a long time. You would get hungry and eat all of my acorns if I allowed you to shelter here. It is all I can do to feed the, the jitamug, uh, the red squirrels as well, and those little chipmunks. Be off with you. Well, that little Benishi thought, perhaps, perhaps that oak tree is a little crowded. Maybe the butternut tree will help me. So he hopped over to that butternut tree and asked him if he could shelter there until spring. But that butternut tree huffed. Isn't it bad enough that the Anishinaabe and those bears are pawing through my branches and stealing all my nuts? Must I be bothered by another beggar as well? Off with you. Hop south if you cannot fly. Just leave me alone. Well, thought that little Benishi, I suppose it must be tiring to have people always bothering you for your tasty nuts. Hmm. Maybe the willow will help me. Well, that willow just said, get out of here. I don't talk to strangers and you are a stranger. We have never met. Well, clearly Benashi was just stunned by that response as that willow said, is it possible that some lesser tree might not mind a strange bird hopping on its branches? But I certainly do. Go away. So that little Benishi just hung his head and hid under the one good wing he had. Such a lack of hospitality. The disrespect and humiliation hurt even more than the pain of his broken wing. He looked forward to the coming of the north wind when he knew he would just get drowsy and slip into the last long sleep if he could not find shelter. In his pain, he almost thought it might be better. But no, he thought, my family expects me to be brave. If no one can help me, I have to help myself. Maybe I should just start hopping and maybe I will get to the south one before Giwaden blows again. As that little Benishi started hopping south, he heard a friendly voice call, little brother, little brother, come here, come over here. You may live in my branches all during winter if you choose. I have lots of room. If your wing is too sore for you to follow your kind to the Southland, it's time for the trees to offer their assistance. That little Benishi hopped gratefully into the low branches of that spruce tree and huddled close to her warm foliage. Indeed, said the deep booming voice of the tall white pine. I can help shelter both of you when the cold winds blow. And then the Gizhik, the cedar tree, also said, I can offer my cones for your food. Safe in the branches of his new friends, that little Benishi settled down to wait out winter. As Giwaden, the, the north wind, came down upon the forest glade, the little Benishi was snug and sheltered again. Giwaden raged over the forest, heaped snow into deep piles, and then arranged them and rearranged them to suit his fancy. As he blew, Giwaden asked Skichimonadu if he could have all the leaves of the trees as he passed. No, said Gichimonadu. You may have the leaves of that cedar, or you may have the leaves of the birch. You may have the leaves of the oak and the butternut and the willow. But leave those, those leaves to the spruce, the white pine, and the cedar, who have taken care of that little Benichi with the broken wing. You may not have their leaves. They shall keep their leaves forever when you blow over the land. So when I think of that story, I often think about this question of what does Anishinaabe, you know, if we think of Anishinaabe stories as our laws, what do our laws tell us about both our ontologies of care, um, which Shiri Pasternak has um, described as our kind of sense of world, Anishinaabe worldview around how we care for one another. Um, but also what does our Anishinaabe stories tell us about Anishinaabe obligations and responsibilities to care for others? And in this story, I can't help but think about um, the correlations between that little bird and um, many of our relatives who um, find themselves without housing.
And so I want to think through this story to think about, you know, how do we understand the need for housing or shelter as a human right, um, also a treaty right, as we know our ancestors, um, you know, negotiated many of these treaties with our uh, long-term um, good health and interest in mind. Um, and what is our responsibilities and obligations to to ensure that um, we we carry out these ontologies of care? So when I reflect on this story, I can't help but bring up, I have more questions than answers. So here's some of the questions that come to mind for me. What does it mean that the little bird in this story is first blown off a tree branch and, and his wing is broken in that process? Is there a particular kind of duty of care or obligation that is held by either that wind that blew him off the branch or the branch that failed to provide the secure protection for that little bird in the first place, producing the harm that would then um, lead to his own kind of precarity around housing um, and ultimately lead to his homelessness. Also, what does it mean that we must try to help ourselves? And indeed, in many moments in this um, story, we hear this little bird um, kind of trying to build up their own um, kind of uh, will to live, their will to go on um, by reminding themselves of their own accountability and obligations to um, try to help themselves. And in many ways, that becomes um, the motivating agent for that little bird in these very difficult and trying times. What also does it mean for these different animals, um, I'm sorry, these different trees to have refused shelter? And indeed the bird offers a very generous interpretation of why these different trees might not be able to provide care. And we see that first with the birch tree, uh, where the birch tree expresses concern about its own ability, her or his own ability to provide care for those whom the birch tree already has a responsibility to if that birch allows another bird to come in and shelter. Which to me raises these important questions about, you know, what does capacity, our own capacities to help others, how does that shape um, how we might think about ontologies of care and a kind of duty of care or um, a responsibility of care to others. Uh, we see that um, that little Benishi recognizes that perhaps that birch tree can't handle the weight of another bird on its branches um, and may be too weak to care for the Benishi. Uh, and so that Benishi turns to the oak, but the oak tree recognizes that with a request for housing comes also a kind of responsibility to provide food. And so you see a connection between housing and um, subsistence that occurs in that part of the story where the oak becomes concerned that if the oak is to house the Benishi, the oak tree would also have a responsibility, a correlating duty, if you would, to feed that little Benishi and recognizes that they're already feeding many of the squirrels and concerned about their ability to, to bring additional um, care to others. The butternut tree seems mostly just irritated um, at those pesky Anishinaabe for already eating so many of their delicious nuts um, and the bears for the same. Um, and so we don't know within the story whether um, we're hearing about the kinds of frustrations that people might feel when um, they're feeling taxed, um, or if we're just um, learning about some of the different kinds of emotions that go through um, entities who are leaned on for supports. The willow is completely closed off to even hearing anything the Benishi has to say, um, and is un like, um, 
you know, essentially argues they refuse to talk to strangers, but in the process is kind of putting their arms up um, in a kind of closed off manner that's about closing off relationship building, right? To say, I, if I am not already in relationship with you, I am not interested in um, extending any kind of practice that would enable us to come into relationship. Um, but we see that it is the spruce, the pine, the white pine and the cedar who work collaboratively to ensure that the spruce alone is not left um, to bear the full burden and weight of caring for that little Benishi. Um, they work together to meet the needs of the Benishi. And as a result of their generosity, their kind of um, hospitality and, and a willingness to extend um, acts of care to that little Benishi, the creator looks down upon what they've done and, and refuses to let that north wind take their leaves. And so, you know, each winter, often when our nations come into, you know, moments of hardship, as those winter days become dark and cold and our own ability to access um, some of our own resources become more and more bare, those trees that have kept their leaves, that spruce, that white pine and that cedar serve to remind us of the importance of um, providing care for others in times of need. And so here I'm really interested in thinking about, you know, how do we think again about housing as a human right? And the 2019 National Housing Strategy Act recognizes housing as a human right although Canada has um, not moved as far in terms of recognizing housing in terms of treaty rights. Um, but through the National Housing Strategy Act, um, recognizes the need to realign policies and programs towards this perspective of housing as a human right. Yet too often this commitment has failed to take up um, indigenous jurisdiction and decision-making authority when it comes to addressing um, the, the, the issues around um, housing precarity and homelessness um, in many uh, cities and areas. And so too often um, provinces and the federal government fail to look to Indigenous legal traditions to think about, you know, what our own responsibilities and commitments must be to our fellow humans. So, you know, this not only brings up a question of what is our right to housing, but more importantly, focuses instead on what are our obligations to ensure that others are sheltered. And here I want to think about kind of um, one specific case study um, following the pandemic and the rise of homelessness that we saw in many cities. Um, we saw in the city of Victoria. Um, a significant increase in the amount of people who were unhoused um, in the, I mean, I'm just going to say in during the pandemic. I mean, some would say um, in the wake of or following the pandemic, because um, at this point, um, the city of Victoria had decided or had already recognized in their view that they had met the housing needs of, of those who were unhoused. And so in in that move decided to um, stop allowing a 24 hour encampments. And so, um, you know, obviously prior to their ability to uh, make housing options available, the city of Victoria was obligated to enable individuals to shelter in parks um, because of the la lack of adequate housing in cities. And so um, in 2020, then we see um, many, many uh, people were still sheltering in parks and um, specifically in Megan or Beacon Hill Park um, in Victoria. So for anyone who has been in Victoria and been to um, Beacon Hill, you know, it's this large um, park in the middle of the city. Um, 
you know, that many think is pristine and beautiful and natural. Um, and they want to ensure that it's preserved in many ways. Um, but actually, uh, Megan is now um, situated as a trust. So it's interesting in that it's different from some other parks because um, Megan was initially um, the Lekwungen uh, speaking people. So Aswaima and Songhees folks were essentially dispossessed of this territory by the Hudson Bay Company in 1843 when they established Fort Victoria. Um, and then in 1882, this land was essentially uh, transferred to the city of Victoria and established as a trust. And so in that establishment as a trust, um, the land was essentially said to um, be set for like the public use and recreation. So the park is the largest park in Victoria, covering approximately 183 acres and is the city's primary feature park. Um, again, including what they say is natural areas, many of which are environmentally sensitive, culturally sensitive, manicured green space, horticultural areas, two sports fields, a golf putting green, a baseball diamond, a cricket pitch, a lawn bowling pitch, outdoor fitness equipment, tennis courts, two playgrounds, and water parks. Well, they say spray parks, so little water pads. Um, as well, there's a children's petting zoo, a music performance stage, maintenance yard, pathways and roadways, artificial ponds, sculptures, and monuments. Um, and a story pool. So since it was transferred to the city uh, in 1882, the park's been used for a range of purposes, which for example, have included cattle grazing, digging gravel pits and the like continued after the settlement of the trust. Um, there were various camping um, expeditions with the Boy Scouts camping there uh, in 1913. During the 1970s, the park was used as a campground with limited opposition from the city um, and five acres of the park were used during World War I to house and train soldiers with at least 20 structures being built for this purpose by the time they were dismantled um, in 1917. And then Beacon Hill Park Nursery was established in 1909 and it supplied plants for city parks and boulevards and also generated revenue uh, through commercial sales that um, would take place until the 1930s. Um, yeah, and so there's also been some festivals, but there's been lots of um, concern around the use of the park. So on March 18th, 2020, the province declared a state of emergency in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which led local shelters and social service providers to either suspend their services or dramatically downsize such services to, to pr um, prevent the spread of COVID. This resulted in numbers of persons who were homeless and sheltering in public parks to increase from approximately 24 to 35 shelters before March of 2020 to 465 by April of 2020. So this phrase for the use, recreation and enjoyment of the public um, is one of the, the concerns that um, was, was brought forward. So in the trust, uh, Megan, essentially Beacon Hill Park is framed as being for the use, recreation and enjoyment of the public. And so um, a organization brought a claim forward to the city of Victoria saying that it was violating its trust um, because the park um, should not be used to shelter unhoused individuals um, because that was a violation of the use, recreation, and enjoyment of the public. Um, and essentially, the city, um, the court did find that uh, the trust does not permit the park um, to be used for temporary sheltering by people experiencing homelessness and that such activities by members of the uh, public is contrary to the purpose of the trust. 
Um, and so I reflect on this like particular moment, both because of the fact that, um, you know, at the time that the park was um, being used for shelter, there was lots of volunteer efforts taking place to ensure that uh, duties of care and obligation were being met uh, for those who were living in the park. So numerous volunteers had um, put up fixed showers, which became part of the concern um, because fixed showers were significantly more cost effective and um, cheaper than mobile showers. Um, they were also, you know, ensuring that a number of wraparound services were being provided to folks um, sheltering in the park. Um, but essentially those efforts were easily uh, dismantled by um, one society bringing concern to the court that the trust was somehow in violation. And during this time, at no point was there concern given to uh, indigenous jurisdiction or political authority over this territory um, with little attention being given to uh, bringing in um, individuals from the local territories to speak to the proper use of the land. Um, and indeed, there are a number of culturally sensitive areas within the park um, that uh, the local nations have really struggled to try to protect and, and um, be able to carry their authority over. And so, you know, this is one moment in which I think we see a real contradiction um, at work in Canadian law um, where we can recognize housing as a human right um, and yet will take up um, questions within the court around these particular moments in which folks are uh, encamped um, and trying to secure shelter that will turn to these very narrow kinds of notions around um, the obligation to protect and preserve parks for the public good. Um, you know, in many ways, I think this example brings into question who constitutes the public and what that good is. Um, and there's a PhD student here at UVic who's doing really great work, um, Kaylin, all around um, this specific um, case and uh, the issue of, of encampments in uh, Megan. Um, so I wanted to raise that. And then I want to you know, I know I've taken a lot of time, so just spend a few um, more minutes talking about another kind of area of concern for how we think about, you know, how do we enact ontologies of care, duties of care? How do we ensure that um, our communities are safe, but that we're also um, ensuring the well-being of individuals? And, you know, one, another case in which I think we see this happening is um, the ways in which many First Nations and Indigenous nations in the U.S. as well have been stripped of our political authority in ways that then limit our abilities to restore and revitalize our legal traditions that can give rise to these ontologies of care. And so, for example, many nations have struggled with addressing the issues that arise from addictions um, with particular concern being given to the um, impacts that come into communities when you have active um, drug dealers in the community, as well as um, how communities should respond to extreme violent offenders, um, such as gang members. And so um, a number of nations have turned to um, the kind of historic cultural practice of banishment um, as a way to carry out a duty of care for the community. Um, and so a number of nations have, um, in the, you know, in the kind of wake of having processes that enable um, nations to carry out practices that might mitigate harm in earlier stages, um, we often have to turn to these extreme practices like banishment. Um, but I was really interested in, you know, I, one of the things I'm really interested in thinking about is, 
how do we restore those practices um, that can mitigate harm before we have to take extreme um, action such as banishment. Uh, and so there have been some challenges against Indigenous nations around the use of banishment. Um, some people have framed banishment as the as an extreme form of incarceration that essentially um, creates like the entire world as the prison, but the reserve as the place you cannot go. Um, and, you know, um, of course, many have critiqued banishment for the ways in which this practice in the present merely pushes harmful offenders into other communities, whereas historically in practice, it would have largely resulted in the death of those who were banished um, in their own struggles to um, survive in a precarious world that was, you know, really dependent on relations with others. But in 2012, an Ojibwe man who was banished from the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe's in Minnesota also raised questions around the kinds of constitutionality of banishment. And so here he wanted to question whether or not the Mille Lacs were violating their own laws. Um, and so the Court of Appeals addressed the constitutionality of the, and here they're talking about Mille Lacs Constitution, not the U.S., um, but the Court of Appeals addressed the constitutionality of the ban's exclusion and removal ordinance as it applies to a ban member under the ban um, and the Minnesota Chippewa Tribes Constitution, as well as whether the ordinance was valid under the Indian Civil Rights Act, which is um, legislation that protects some of the human rights of Indigenous people from our own nations. So the court, and this is a tribal court, uh, utilizing the importance of maintaining relationships rationale held that a heightened standard of removal for band members applies, quote, because they possess a unique interest in remaining on the Mille Lacs reservation that non-members may not possess. And so here, the, the nation had used banishment to remove non-members a number of times, but were being challenged in their ability to remove their own members, whether or not they had a higher kind of duty of obligation. So the court remanded the matter back to the lower court to stay the removal petition. Um, and the court emphasized then the importance of kinship and community relationships, stating it could certainly impair a band member's right to exercise his religion if, his um, if he is desirous of learning the traditional ways of the Anishinaabeg and his access to the patrimony necessary for practicing these ways was defeated by his inability to come onto the reserve or onto the reservation. The court also believes that a right of a person to live with his child and raise his child is that type of intimate relationship that many courts have recognized and have recognized as being within that core group of persons whom a person has the First Amendment right to live with and associate with. So this principle embodying then the importance of maintaining relationships was utilized um, by the band um, as a way to say that one must have a kind of heightened um, duty of care to their members uh, and cannot banish them without um, ensuring that they're explicit about the conditions that can lead to banishment. And so in this case, um, the court essentially remanded back to the legislative body that they revisit their banishment code um, to ensure that it's not overly general and vague and that it's descript in its um, duties and obligations to their members. And so it's been, you know, um, over 12, 14 years, whatever the math is on 2012, um, and the Millocs are still working on um, their banishment code as they think about and take up these important questions of like, what are our obligations and duties, not just to the individual, not just to the community well being, but when we think about community well being only through a lens of harm, we fail to sometimes see the kinds of harms that can that get produced by our responses, right? So in this case, they were really questioning what the long-term implications of banishment would mean, not 
only for this individual um, who would have limited access then to their spiritual traditions and practices, um, but also to their ability to be in relationship with their relatives, to be in relationship with their children. Um, the case goes on to talk about the ways, that the, the kinds of duties and obligation of this individual to pass on traditions to the children that would be limited um, by their banishment. And yet banishment has also been used in cases where um, communities are experiencing extreme um, forms of harm that need to be addressed. Um, and so much like this question of housing, you know, I think um, both of these different um, contexts speak to this important question of what does a duty of care or what do ontologies of care tell us about what our responsibilities and obligations are to one another? Um, what are the ways in which we might restore and revitalize our own legal traditions um, that can help our communities respond to harm and conflict as they occur um, while enacting uh, these ontologies of care in response to um, our fellow relatives. So I'll leave it there and open it for the question. Heidi, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, yeah, I will maybe just open by saying what a beautiful, kind, uh, reflective and creative space you've just opened for the 300 plus people who are joining us from coast to coast to coast and from around the world. Um, it, it was just a, a beautiful and resonant, uh, dare I say, deeply caring, um, kind, consideration of a topic that is not only incredibly timely and pressing and sharp right now, but as you've so beautifully kind of articulated, uh, stunningly interdigitated with other legal uh, landscapes and histories that uh, kind of produce somewhat um, conflicting ontologies uh, that, that need to be looked at. So there's been um, a remarkable number of reflections in the chat, uh, many of which I think uh, focus in some ways uh, on that 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 initial um, that initial question that you posed. So a lot of the questions in the chat are are talking about things like, um, you know, what are what are the larger responsibilities of larger systems, mm -hmm. uh, and and you 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 moved from your story to a provocation wherein you asked like what is the responsibility of that first branch that allowed little benici to to fall or that that what what was that responsibility of the larger system and and i i just wondered if you wouldn't mind for many of the folks in the um, Q and A session who are asking that, like, what is the, these larger systems? What's that branch, um, and and how do we kind of move back to that branch? And then I think there will be other questions about the trees that said no to little Benici. Mm -hmm. That, but but can you talk a bit more about that that branch, that initial fall? Yeah. Um... I mean, it's such a great question. And when I think of um, often myself, because I do think it is like um, these systems that need to, you know, we see by the end of the story, these various trees working together. And, you know, when we think about this larger system, it's often, I think, in the failing of working together and thinking through questions around, you know, not what is my right, but what is my responsibility and obligation towards others that can really dictate um, how we behave towards one another that attend to and account for, you know, our deeply interconnected world. Um, and so in that case, you know, I think the that first branch, it, it kind of poses this question of like, did that but we don't know from the story, at least the version that um, you know I shared today, we don't know if that branch had made some prior commitment to protect the Benishi, um, or if Benishi had presumed 
there would be a kind of commitment to protection. Um, you know, and so there's this interesting kind of question about who's responsible. Should Benishi have known that that branch wasn't um, sheltered itself enough in ways that could ensure that little bird's protection? Um, you know, one could argue that both the bird and the branch have um, a kind of accountability or responsibility for the harm that occurred. Um, one could for sure argue that the wind himself is likely, you know, deeply responsible. And yet throughout that story, we know that that North wind is known for that behavior, right? So um, in some ways the North wind, you know, is the one that um, is causing hardship, is producing harm. Um, and yet, you know, we also understand the need of the North Wind in terms of those kinds of cycles of life change that occur or seasonal change, right? Um, and so this idea of like the good person, like the good and the bad or the villain and the victim don't work, right? And I think that in many ways, it's that kind of binary and dichotomy that has made it so challenging for us to know how to um, come to better solutions for these questions around community safety. Because um, when we get fixated on who's a victim and who's a perpetrator, we fail to see the kinds of intersections that are working. Um, and we respond only to those things instead of thinking through the, the deep kinds of relationships at work, right? And so, you know, I think that's what always made me think about you know, wanting to reflect on banishment, which I closed with very briefly, um, just because like I both understand like the concern communities are, are you know, facing and, and feeling the pressure communities are feeling to protect their young, you know, and to protect their, and they're out the, the vulnerable really, right? Um, and that they don't have many, um, you know, processes or resources available to ensure protections. And so sometimes removing a person who is causing harm becomes, you know, that only like mechanism that one can invoke. And yet that's still somebody's child and somebody's father or mother or brother, right? And so when we fail to think about our relationships and obligations to one another, we tend to produce like one dimensional solutions that often won't get us towards the kinds of communities we want to be, you know? So I, I'm really trying to think about like, how do we get closer to who we want to be as a people? Um, and I think our like Anishinaabe stories at least constantly tell us, um, you know, try to push us towards these, these like, um, responsibilities of care and relationality that are about, you know, providing for others in need, recognizing that, you know, we live in a precarious world and that our own ability to invoke our own needs um, in those kinds of moments require us living in a world where everyone gives when they can, right? So, um, so yeah, I'm trying to think about like, how do we how do we produce law that's generative, that's not just prohibitive, but instead like gets us closer to the kinds of nations we want to be, the kinds of communities we want to be, the kinds of relatives we want to be to one another? I'm so uh, moved and I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of emotion being generated in the, um, in the Q&A uh, stream that I'm kind of keeping an eye on. Um, I'm, I'm moved with the generosity of your vision um, of, of sort of a better ethic of care, a better ontology of care. So the question that I'm about to pose in some ways uh, is, is in a bit of tension with, because I mean, I'll, I'll be transparent here and tell you that as a poet, uh, I, I'm very biased towards story as an incredible means of moving hearts and minds. But um, we do have a question in the chat, and I think uh, it's a it's an interesting question, given that you know the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health uh, is a 
SARS responsive, originally health determinants kind of area. One of the questions is about um, data, like is there, which is, which is in some ways somewhat antithetical to, I think the spirit and the evocations that you're making about stories about generative kind, uh, future reaching ont ontological ways of being. Um, but one of the questions is like, how how do we ground this in data uh, to possibly, and I, I'm reading into the question and the observation, to maybe make this even more legible to people who aren't fluent in, dare I say, humanistic mm -hmm. kind of story-based ways of knowing? Like, is there a way to make what you're saying legible to quantitative data wonks. And that's not meant to be pejorative to any folks yeah, yeah. online who are uh, data wonks. Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I do think there's a lot of work out there that um, that can either be like grounded in data, but turns to story to make sense of data. Um, and a lot of data that's generated from story, you know, so I do think these things can um, work together and they can be incredibly um, effective, especially in generating policy change. Um, and so, you know, um, I had mentioned that before we started this webinar, that this particular work around homelessness and, and housing precarity is part of a bigger project that's thinking about like what our communities, how our communities are responding to harm and conflict. And so, it's really interested in also looking at um, gender-based violence, specifically in the context of sexual assault and intimate partner uh, violence, as well as looking at um, the kinds of repercussions that can produce in family dynamics that leads to child apprehension. And the numbers, the data in those areas, as well as in like on this, how we understand homelessness, has been really important for also um, making clear a particular kind of um, story. So one thing um, in some of the data I was looking at to think through like homelessness in Victoria, there was a report done in 2020 um, in the city of Victoria. And so these numbers are coming based off their respondents, but um, it comes from the point in time homelessness count. So it was a 2020 report in, again, study in Victoria, um, where they found that one in three of the respondents of folks who were homeless at that moment had been children in care. That, you know, we're, we're looking at somewhere around 30 some percent of our homeless population having been kids in care and that having been a child in care significantly increases one's risk for housing precarity. We have to think about what are those connections, right? That 91% of women who are homeless have also experienced violence in their lives, right? That these are not discrete. There's a reason I'm trying to look at these things together, right? Because these are intersecting in ways that require us to, you know, well, take a very intersectional approach to ontologies of care. Um, but to also recognize like what might be the things causing harm. You know, 35% of folks in Victoria who are homeless are indigenous, despite making up only 5% of the population. Of that 35%, half of that population are indigenous people to First Nations on Vancouver Island which tells us that there's a whole lot of things happening, right? So what are the kinds of things those numbers tell us? Well, they tell us that, you know, there's already a lot of housing precarity on reserve, that, you know, dispossession is one of the major kinds of productions of, um, you know, a, actual dispossession from our territories is one of the reasons we see indigenous populations um, being at greater risk for homelessness. In addition to that, we know that there's housing shortages on reserves, that housing is deeply underfunded, um, that many reserves, um, many First Nations don't even have enough land to like build additional housing, um, that there's overcrowding happening. But in addition, 
because of colonial policies that have deeply impacted our communities, we also need greater services that can address harm and safety concerns happening in communities that are then um, contributing to people like exiting those communities and then being at greater risk for um, homelessness, right? So all of those things are, um, you know, the data can give us those, those narratives in some ways and the narratives can help us understand the data. Like why do we see so many people Whose, whose nations are front, are in this place still like experiencing homelessness. Well, this can help, you know, if we look to them, the stories, like some of these reports in, in Victoria, um, we're really careful to both produce the data as well as include the stories of people's lives um, because a lot of it helped. The, the, the narratives they told not only you know, could enable us to think through data from a people-centered kind of perspective, but could also help us make sense of why some people don't feel safe accessing particular emergency shelters, why some families are struggling um, with some of the forms of housing that's being made available, right? So um, that if we want to think about why a number of people were still in encampments in the parks, because those produced forms of community that carried out obligations and duties of care for one another that people were not receiving from their so-called social workers or caseworkers, right? Like, so you have um, the, these communities of care being produced within, you know, through peer support within parks that people found challenging to reproduce in those kinds of short-term housing solutions that were made available. Um, and so the stories, when we hear them from people along with the data can help us, you know, think more creatively about what kinds of solutions are needed. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question, but I could ramble forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it certainly, um, it satisfied uh, the the question that that I posed in terms of, uh, my desire for an answer. So I think it um, it was a, a thoughtful and expansive and rich answer, um, much like your talk. Um, so thank thanks again. Thank um, there's uh, another data question, but it it, uh, it it'll just be a restatement if you can offer it, and I'll ask that. But there's oh, yeah. a broader question, which I I think um, I'll ask you the data question just for the sake of audience. Um, but this is an interesting question. It, they're, they're, they're linked in some ways, so I'll, I'll read them directly. Mm -hmm. You talk about how trees function together to share responsibility and expand capacity broadly. Um, but there's sort of a sub-question to that, which is, can you talk about how reserves handle homelessness in their communities? So, like, is there, what's what's the like the larger metaphor and story of trees about in terms of being in community or yeah. even if it's an issue, the question that was posed, like, is that an issue in an on-reserve homelessness? But I'll, I'll just quickly get you to answer or just say again, could you please repeat the percentage of women in homelessness who have suffered violence and do we know if it's sexual violence? That's that's the kind of data wonky specific question. Right. And then moving to that larger metaphorical question of trees, uh, like the the integrated nature, yeah, yeah. and uh, some some reflections and contemplations on homelessness in and on reserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I suspect that the rate of um, violence experienced by women who um, experience homelessness might look a little different depending on the study. So the 2020 point in time homelessness count um, figured 91% uh, of women who are homeless have experienced violence. Um, one could speculate that that's probably higher for Indigenous women because we do know from like many of the various reports around gender-based violence that Indigenous women experience um, violence and specifically sexual assault, um, but also the combination of, um, like Indigenous women face much higher rates of assault than 
than um, their white counterparts, um, but also like often also experience um, like multiple accounts of assault and then also often experience um, like high levels of violence with that assault. So um, there's an increased rate of physical violence that often accompanies the experience of sexual assault um, for indigenous women. Um, and those numbers were actually really instrumental in shifting some policy in the United States that would enable um, our indigenous nations to have some kind of greater control over our solutions to gender-based violence. Um, but in the US context, that was really like specific to domestic violence, um, despite the fact that most of the data shows that um, most violence experienced by native women come at the hands of non-native men, um, but doesn't necessarily parse out how much of that is like non-native men in relationship with native women versus um, outside of that. So, so yeah, so it was 91% in the 2020 point in time homelessness count. Um, and then, so the other question um, around the trees working together, kind of forgot that one, but I'll start with the like communities experiencing homelessness. Um, I think the reason we see crowded housing on reserve is because that's our response to homelessness. Um, that like essentially we are constantly carrying out those ontologies of care in particular ways that, you know, I've just never been in a space where someone hasn't always tried to ensure I've been fed um, and then I have a place to sleep. Um, those just have always, like, and I, that's just the response I've had from like any indigenous person anywhere I've been, whether I've been in the city, whether I've been on the reserve, whether it's nations that are not my own or nations that are, you know, like, um, I think it's just so deeply built into like um, many of our practices that, um, that you do see then like a lot of, crowding in houses as, as a specific response to a lack of housing, right? So you don't necessarily see as many people um, out on the streets and that's just because people aren't gonna leave their family out on the streets. What that does also mean though, is there are, um, when you have people who are also struggling with mental health issues, with addictions, um, there is like an increase to, um, you know, kind of safety concerns and things that can happen in spaces where you have so many people living together. Um, and so some communities have responded to that by um, producing um, housing responses to, you know, specifically domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Um, I've, I've been currently looking for lots of the different kinds of responses to to homelessness and most of them are um, like from coming from indigenous communities and most of them are in kind of urban settings, um, which is not to say, I'm sure there are many more that are happening um, in community, but um, they've just been harder to find. Um, but again, I do think that's also because it looks different because an ontology of care is kind of already being carried out on some levels, but we're back to this question of like, what does it mean when, when those trees are at capacity? Um, and what are the kinds of duties to work um, together to ensure that um, greater supports are given so that these trees aren't failing to meet the needs of those they're in kind of responsibility um, or relationship to? Yeah, and this is a bit, of an editorialization, Dr. Stark, but, you know, I think if we run questions about crowding and housing through a, a white supremacist legal colonial lens, you then have lots of potential for things like the Ministry for Children and Family Development to mm -hmm. impose discussions about neglect and about overcrowding and about the health, mm -hmm. which then allows a narrative of uh, removal of children, stealing children, yeah. as colonial uh, powers have done uh, since moments of contact, which then, of course, spirals those kids, as your data so eloquently demonstrates, into uh, a potential life 
of uh, being unhoused by the very system that produced the unsafe environments in, in the first place. So it's as, as always in so many equations of colonial violence, um, the colonial white supremacist house stacks the rules so that the house always wins. And in this case, it literally is a house and a housing issue as, as, as you've so generously and kindly uh, pointed out, which again, I guess allows me to ask the question that one of the the participants really honestly people are totally engaged you can't see all the messages but yeah, yeah. people are excited so Heidi thank you again um but I think uh there there's a question that that is about these binaries that you've pointed out how that binaristic yeah. sort of short term uh models equations thought processes are are problematic like they are inherently divisive a duality mm -hmm. is divisive. So one of the questions is, can you talk more about Western binaries that shape how we care and then extend that? How do we do research? How do we provide services for and about each other and, and all of us? Like, how is that binary? Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to expand on that, that would be great. Yeah, um, no, it's a great question. Um, I think like the first example that comes to mind, because I've also been doing some work around Indigenous communities trying to restore um, child well-being laws, um, is, you know, that a lot of times we see, like, what a binary produces, right, is that we have someone who has a need, like, who is in need, and someone who is not. And often that person in need is also sometimes, like, framed as the, the perpetrator or the harmer, right? So in cases of child um, apprehension or risks of apprehension, you see a kind of framing of one parent potentially like um, having their rights limited in particular ways, um, but then they're offered sometimes particular services. This was something that we were talking about in a meeting of like a dozen of us with and some of the nations working on their law where we were saying, okay, so that's really good and that's needed. Like we want healthy communities. We want family members who are struggling with addictions and other issues to receive the services they need. But how come we don't provide some additional supports to the person who's still caring for the children? Like, why aren't we doing more to think about, you know, what they're like, you know, that sometimes the binary we like through a kind of binaristic viewpoint, we fail to see like how needs are operating in both contexts, but also like, um, you know, this is where so much of the work around family preservation has been so important, right? And that's the same around housing, where if we can address like housing precarity before people are homeless and the same goes, like if we can address the issues that are occurring in families before children are removed, it's far more cost effective. It's far more, um, you know, better for the health of the community, of the family and so on, right? So, you know, in housing, a lot of things people talk about is we have to deal with like how evictions are operating. We have to deal with how particular kinds of programs like 30 day, you know, treatment centers that then cause people to lose housing because they miss payments. Or, you know, if someone's being charged for a particular crime that often, um, I think they were, one of the reports was talking about how in Victoria, you know, someone would be, you know, I think arrested for having alcohol in the park or something, and it would be a 30 day um, uh, sentence that would often then be the very thing that would cause people to lose the services they need to secure housing or to keep housing and so on, right? So, um, you know, but at the same time, when we think about like family supports, we often, um, won't take a very holistic view of that. And so some nations, I remember, you know, I think it was at least a decade ago, maybe two decades ago, one of the Ojibwe nations was carrying out a project where um, when they were dealing with family matters, if there was a dispute in the family that caused, you know, the parents to separate uh, and they, um, or that required some kind of removal, they said they would no longer remove children, that only parents could be removed, like only caregivers or guardians could be removed from the house, that the children had to be able to retain um, their ability to stay in their home, that they they shouldn't have to both suffer the loss of like that person who provides care for them and the safe space that they're used to. Um, so they created kind of a community response program that 
um, ensured people, other caregivers would come into the home so that those children would at least have some of those um, comforts instead of like um, producing compounding like impacts or traumas, right? So, um, so yeah, that's one way I think about the binary. You know, I think of another as like, I mean, I think this is part of the issue that comes up around like assault, uh, physical violence, but also sexual assault and intimate partner violence is that, you know, often those who become perpetrators have been victims themselves. Um, and that when we only think in binaries, we fail to respond to the harms being produced um, as being a byproduct of harms experienced. And that's not to say that that becomes um, an excuse for that behavior or that that behavior should be tolerated, right? But that our responses to um, any kind of restoration of the person um, and their relationships with others and their communities requires that we attend to um, individuals as sitting in both of those spaces as someone who has probably been harmed and carried out harm. Um, and really, I think that, you know, taking up these issues can also like help us to understand how we are all always doing these things, right? And that like Anishinaabe stories have always been about questioning our own kind of like subjectivity or positionality as people who are both harming and being harmed that, you know, we have to like stop producing narratives in which we're all innocent that, you know, we're always all in relationship and relationship comes with, you know, distinct perspectives and experiences in which, you know, I may not intend to harm another person in a particular action, but I might do that. And, you know, us not having better mechanisms to address that, even in the small scale, like micro um, harms, is, is I think part of what's enabling such a failure of vision for how to address that on the, the kind of large scale um, responses to harm. So, you know, I do, I think the, the kind of bigger project started with this kind of question, you know, a bunch of us were doing land-based work and we just kept finding that every time we would go out into these spaces, something would go wrong. And we were like, we have to stop being surprised by this. We know that there will be harm or conflict. So let's start making sure we have the mechanisms in, in place to address harm or conflict when it arises, right? So I think it's like that question around homelessness too. Like we're never going to get to a space where there's never anyone experiencing homelessness, right? That instead we want to make sure we have systems that are responsive to a harm the moment it occurs so that we aren't compounding that harm and that we that we can be responsive in ways that can um, address that that harm more efficiently, you know, more lovingly, more compassionate, and more quickly, right? That if we recognize that there are always going to be people who need to like access particular services, then we need to make sure those services are ready to respond to those people. Um, yeah. Heidi, we, we uh, um, all I can say is I hope that uh, one day soon you and I get to go out for lunch so that I can continue <laughs> to just really enjoy what feels to me like an incredibly intellectually sharp and smart and yet uh, kindly elegant and compassionate sort of sense of intersecting non-binaristic ways of orienting to complicated, messy questions. Um, but we have four minutes now before we right. say goodbye to you. And I I feel like there's a question that's so beautiful. Uh, I would ask that that you reflect on it and that that we end with this um this person's question, which is um Heidi, how do we take these teachings, the teachings that you've offered us? Uh, into our lives for many to continue to live for many who continue to live with the realities and intersections of homelessness and housing insecurities in our families. Sometimes it feels hopeless. Uh, it feels impossible to take up a duty of care 
when systems are so overwhelmingly failing. And I don't, I, I don't want to, I, I, I hope that that um, opens up your ability to gesture for something hopeful um, for, for all of us. I think we've really uh, benefited a, benefited from such kind wisdom that you've offered today, but there's somebody out there who I think is looking for, for hope. Yeah. I mean, and I guess I think in closing, like I really do think that the most important thing, like for anyone who works, you know, in city spaces for, um, you know, provincial or federal agencies, restoring Indigenous authority over our lives is the key answer to like addressing these issues. It just is like we are the best equipped to deal with our own problems. Um, and that these are problems that have largely been imposed into our communities because of colonialism and because of the barriers and challenges produced by um, state policies and state laws. And so um, continuing to ask us to turn to the state to like solve the problems they've produced is just not helpful. Um, so, you know, I do think most importantly, we need to restore um, jurisdiction and political authority back to Indigenous nations in all capacities of our lives. Um, and I think, you know, that this story, you know, there are mo many moments and when that little Benishi, every time I say that word, my youngest son's name is Benishi. So I always think of my son when I think of that story. Um, but that little bird faces many moments of feelings of despair and lacks hope and, and feels hopeless in many ways. Um, and, you know, these are the moments where I just have to say that, you know, I think our ancestors, like the fact that we know these stories today in the wake of the things that our ancestors had to experience, to me, speaks just magnitudes to the kind of, um, you know, I mean, it sounds so cheesy and romantic to say this, but the perseverance of our people, right? And so, you know, I do think it is very hard to, to take up a duty of care when systems are overwhelmingly failing. And yet I also think that, you know, it's in these encampments, it's, you know, it was even in my own family in the moments where people were facing their hardest struggles that they also carried out the greatest like capacity to love and give to others. And I often find that those who um, are struggling the most are actually also the most loving and generous. Yeah, we all have our moments, right? But, um, you know, I, I, I would say that I think that there's a real, like, important thing in us looking to those moments to just see the capacity of, of, of human care for one another and love for one another um, that can teach us so much. Um, so I don't know that that provides hope, but I do think it is it is often like I, I so often learn from those who have faced some of the greatest challenges, like in their own capacity to give when they have nothing um, that should remind all of us of the importance of, of generosity as, a, as an ontology of care. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, Heidi, uh, thank you for your generosity today. Thank you for your um, really like I said, moving, generative, and yet compassionate, smart, sharp, uh, caring. I think it, it takes caring to offer your knowledge uh, to the world. Um, and we're ever so grateful to have been here with you. Uh, honestly, Dr. S Dr. Stark, that was um, spectacular. So uh, just a reminder um, that this entire webinar, including uh, Heidi, your really kind and thoughtful and fulsome responses to questions and provocations, that will all be available. Give us a little bit of time to sort of tidy things up and clean things up, but uh, we'll ensure that through our newsletters and through our social media posts that there's uh, updates of when um, this beautiful webinar that you just offered us, Dr. Stark, is available to the public. Um, and uh, I... I can't say with enough conviction from the bottom of my heart, um, thank you again for um, offering hope, but I don't think a naive uh, sort of surficial hope. I think a very deeply intellectualized, kind, compassionate, reflective, and intersecting hope for all of us. I think it's an incredible lesson for all of us uh, working as scholars and activists and frontline practitioners 
um, in the world of uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis health. Heidi, thank you again very, very much. Um, I'll just turn to the folks behind the scenes, Sarah and Lisa C, to see if we're missing anything and if I need to close anything off because, oh my goodness, uh, I have the capacity to bumble these things like nobody's business. Sarah, Lisa, are we all okay and good? We just had the texts that we're good. Uh, we're good for final goodbyes. Uh, I hope to visit you on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people in the not too distant future. Heidi, uh, a real honor to have had this conversation with you. Great, thank you so much. It's been a real honor to be here and thanks to everyone who attended. I'm really grateful to, to um, have this time with you all. Miigwech.